Welcome to the Friday the 13th edition Ooh. of the Clark Howard Show. Scary. You know, our mission is to serve you with advice and information that empowers you to make better financial decisions in your life. And if you decided the best way to handle Friday the 13th is to go hide in a corner, well, you can. Well, they're hiding but, in a corner listening to you. Yeah, okay. But um, are you superstitious about Friday the 13th? No. Are you, would you, if you were given seat assignment 13D on an airplane? I've, that, I've gotten it before. If you were on the 13th floor of a building? I don't even think about it. Okay. I was, uh, I mean, I was born on the 31st, reverse of 13, so maybe it's a good number for me. Yep. Your favorite day of the year. Mm-hmm. Halloween. That's right. So we just told people everything they needed to I know, still, identity. I know. Right, I know. right. I wasn't going to say it. Yep. But anyway, it's time for our Friday the 13th edition of Clark Stinks. And I can't wait to learn from you in the post that Krista will read. And also, gosh, people are so confused trying to understand what's going on when you are buying or selling a home, which there's more activity again, not huge activity, but as mortgage rates have declined some, there's more activity out in the marketplace. How to understand how commissions have changed uh, from when you last were buying or selling a home. I'm going to try to explain the shakeout that's happening and how that plays. And that's coming later. But right now it is time for Clark Stinks. I should have never encouraged you to speak. You must think I'm pretty stupid. You should be ashamed of yourself. Well, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you're right, pal. I'm going to start out with a doozy here. <laughs> okay. I'm ready. Your rant on college made me so mad, I had to sniff used diapers to calm down. <laughs> Your philosophy on college is the reason kids are strapped with thousands of lo in loans for worthless degrees creative writing, philosophy, and ancient studies, 40% of college students quit before they get a degree. Trade schools have lower dropout rates. I'm a tradesman, and there is a shortage of us, thanks to your kind. The trades make as much or more than those with college degrees because the market is flooded with degrees. You said colleges have a marketing problem. What a joke. They have a great marketing program. Just look at the hundreds of millions of dollars these kids are in debt. I hear it every day on podcasts and websites about this debt and the fake promises of big money jobs. I never heard a trademan complain about student debt and never ever needed a politician to wipe the tears from our eyes. I am a proud plumber. Thanks for nothing, John. John, thank you. 100% um, true that uh, people going and getting a trade right now, particularly a licensed trade like you have, is beyond brilliant so many industries are having trouble attracting people uh, who are trained at uh, my favorite state supported technical colleges we have a wonderful technical college system around the country and you are completely right i i don't necessarily agree with you that college is a bust but i do completely agree with everything you said about the value of somebody getting a skill that the marketplace is just desperate to have and it is cheap uh, many times free for you to go to state supported technical college and get a skill where you can walk right in to a really well-paying job and apprenticeships as well Clark doesn't stink in regards to adv advice regarding mailing a rollover check to Vanguard however the Vanguard app has the ability to take a picture of the check and get it into your account. My wife recently did this with a 401k rollover check from a less than friendly and expensive custodian. That's from Patton, Wisconsin, and many people wrote in with the same thing. Yeah, because I do, uh, in my Vanguard account, I also do electronic deposit of checks. And if you, uh, with the new Vanguard um, somewhat improved app, this is very easy to do to deposit a check that way and get it into your account at Vanguard and not have to deal with the mail. And all I can say is it's about time. <laughs> 
This one's for Krista. You don't stink, but I cringe when you start a listener question with, I hope I'm pronouncing this name correctly. You can use a few name pronounce websites to hear an audio clip and read the phonetic spelling of someone's name. I've worked in tech since 2007 and people from around the wor- with people from around the world. Check one of the websites out and pronounce names with confidence, Sarah. And she notes especially pronouncenames.com, which thank you, Sarah. I will check out next time. I'm confused. And, I, you know, and then, Sarah, I would say there are names that can have more Two than one pronunciation. Yeah. And Krista's not the problem on pronunciation. I'm the problem on pronouncing anything. I remember uh, one of the credit card issuers that does a lot of private label. Uh, synchrony. Sy- synchrony, that I always called synchrony. Mm-hmm. It would drive people crazy. What's the other one I would always mess up? Uh, oh, there's, uh, I said other one. There's many. <laughs> okay. P.U., enough already with Florida this, Florida that. Breaking news, there are 49 other states. 90% of us listeners couldn't care a twit about your condos. Tom. Tom. <laughs> More saucy this time. <laughs> <laughs> Getting some pent out frustration. Frustration. So, uh, Tom, the the reason that the Florida thing with the condos has been such a big item is that it's been so disruptive in people's lives, and there's been really nothing else like it elsewhere in the country. And we've had so much movement of population to Florida, uh, newbies who've moved to Florida. In the last few years, it's been an unusual cycle. And now there are as many people leaving Florida as going to it. So the velocity of the market has led to it being a higher priority to talk about. But your point is very well taken. Clark, you spoke of your avoidance of Florida tolls and how much longer your travel time is. How much is your time worth? Is it really worth the extra time on busier roads with stoplights, etc.? Jeff. Yes, Jeff, because I'd say the average human is efficient with maybe 20% of their time. Um, And so there's, I think about, what I got a kick about is when people are driving crazy through traffic and they're racing to get wherever they're going, and then I think, what are they actually doing when they get to where they're going that they race through traffic and did all the dangerous lane changes and all that. I mean, we're really not hyper-efficient beings with our time. So I put a value of basically zero on my time when I'm, when I'm doing something inefficient, like avoiding tolls. And so that's just my philosophy. Clark was asked if there are RMDs on rollover IRAs, and he stated there were not any. This is incorrect. There would be RMDs on a rollover IRA, just like there would be on a 401k or any non-Roth IRA. The person was asking advice about how much to convert from a rollover IRA into a Roth, and then also asked about possible RMDs on the rollover IRA in the future. I think Clark was confused by the wording of the two questions. Please correct this for your audience, Steve in Michigan. And Steve, I don't remember the context of that, but uh, yes, of course. You have to do RMDs, uh, required minimum distributions, is a thing that Congress keeps changing and making more and more complicated. And there's different ages at when people have to do required minimum distributions from traditional 401ks, traditional IRAs, among other traditional products. And um, you've got to do it with any of the traditional money you have. Clark, Not with Ross. Clark, Clark, Clark. Just heard Clark stinks and right out of the chute, something stinky filled the air. This was the person that said they had a good VUL, variable universal life insurance policy. Your answer didn't even convince me, and I am the teacher's pet in the Clark School of VULs. The correct answer should have been simple math. If he made 11% on the VUL, he would have made 15% or more outside the VUL because of the insanely high cost of insurance by having level term plus separate investment strategy. I know this, but other listeners on my might not and could easily have been confused by your answer. I love, love, love the show, but this one left me shaking my head, Greg. Greg, thank you. And yes, when you buy a variable universal life, any version of that, you're paying enormous commissions and ongoing expenses. I mean, 
monstrous commissions and expenses. And so that's uh, one of the factors in why these policies are terrible and why they reduce so much how much wealth you'll have later in life. I was shocked to hear Clark recommend to the mother complaining about the cost of retainers that she should pay for a $1,000 lifetime replacement plan for each child. She had five kids, as I recall. The issue is that it sounds like the orthodontist is providing the cheaper Essex-style retainers, which are similar to a mouth guard tray like Invisalign. The alternative, Howley style, is made of acrylic and wire and is much more durable. As long as the kids don't lose them, a Holly retainer will last 10 years or more. I paid around $250 for my retainers five years ago, and they still look new. That replacement plan is a ripoff. They need to find an ortho that will make the Holly style and qu quit paying for the guy's vacation house. Tyler. Tyler, thank you. I am I'm so in over my head on this. <laughs> uh, is this a term you've ever heard of? No. Uh, nope. Holly, Holly. But I know I can envision it because I've seen retainers like that. And yes, it should, they should, they're much more substantial. Okay. You don't stink, at least in, not in this instance. On your Clark Stinks podcast on August 30th, someone mentioned why you should not use the 50 amp dryer circuit for EV charging. That person's reasons are not correct. I'm an electrical engineer and have knowledge in this area, including the electrical code. The way you have it set, set up is fine with a selector switch from dryer to EV charging at 50 amps with both loads never on at the same time. This, uh, this 50A circuit wiring is protected by the 50A circuit breaker. I can give you some technical explanation or reasons, but it may confuse the issue. Rest assured, your setup is fine, and I was considering doing something similar. Tom. Tom, thank you. I also had somebody stop me in Walmart to talk to me about this <laughs> and say the same thing you just said. And it's kind of like the retainer, you know, I can't know everything. And uh, so that's why we do Clark Stinks. And I so appreciate uh, you writing the post and the gentleman who stopped me in Walmart to talk about it. And uh, it's funny how electric vehicle charging is something people get really, really passionate about. Mm -hmm. So. I appreciate that. Do you know um, the electric vehicle charger that I bought at Costco, bought from Costco.com, is, uh, and it's, you know, it's a third-party one. It's always charged. Our car is fine. Mm. Doesn't work with Lane's new Tesla. Oh, wow. With the Tesla adapter. Oh, that's not good. So I'm getting to go to, those of you who are familiar, I'm getting to go to Wawa a lot. and. <laughs> Charge it, Wawa. Wow. Because fortunately, her car has unlimited free supercharging oh, that's for good. life. That's good. So, but, um, but I'm eating up some of that free with what I spend inside Wawa while I'm waiting for it to charge. <laughs> but I've got to, I've got to now get a new charger to put in there. And it's funny because I sent in a thing to Tesla saying, "Why is this charger not working with it?" Of course, no response. Oh, crickets. Crickets. That's right. So that's a Tesla Stinks added to it. Um, but I want to thank all of you for taking the time to post because there are several things that happen with Clark Stinks. One, I learn things I never knew. I think about angles second that I never would have considered, you know, where I'm narrow visioning and I'm not thinking a wider picture. And then the other thing, in addition to learning from you, I started with, the third thing is I learn also perceptions, how I'm perceived and things that somebody may think about me that aren't really, aren't really true. And so all of it is really, really helpful to me. And I appreciate more than you know, and I look forward to Clark Stinks more than any other thing we do on the podcast each week because I'm a lifelong learner. And I'm, I'm like Curious George. That was my favorite book as a kid. And I always want to learn more. I'm, I'm always curious about this, that, or the other. So that's why I look so forward to Clark Stings. And I appreciate, because I know it takes time to sit down and write one. I appreciate so much you taking that time and doing it. Coming up ahead, I can guarantee you I will generate Clark Stinks from the next topic. I'm going to try to talk through 
how you navigate the new rules on real estate commissions that are now in place around the United States. So the new rules for compensating real estate agents are going to take a while for everybody to figure it out. Let me tell you the baseline. The real estate industry lost an antitrust case, essentially. And now you, if you're going to buy a home, you choose whether you're going to have a buyer's agent and you choose what you're going to compensate that buyer's agent who takes you around. If I'm selling a place, I have what's known as a listing agent if I'm using a real estate agent to sell a property instead of doing for sale by owner. And so I hire a real estate agent and before what would happen, depending on where you were in the country, you would agree up front in that listing agreement to pay compensation of most often around the country 6% more or less. And that's what you would pay in commission. And the listing agent in the contract between buyer and seller, the listing agent would then agree that they would split the commission with the buyer's agent. And so that was, that was the point of the lawsuit is that there was clear price fixing involved because commissions in the United States are all, not the highest in the world, but much higher than the average around the developed world. And so the idea of unbundling it where a buyer decides how valuable it is to have an agent assisting you in buying a home. By the way, if you're a newbie at buying a home or you're in a new area where you're buying a home, new part of the country, um, different state, whatever, the value of that buyer's agent whose experience will be enormous to you. Um, but now you will decide I have been involved in a real estate transaction since the rules changed. And I want to tell you, people are still feeling their way. And by people, I mean the professionals, the agents, are still trying to figure out how to adjust to this. And the reality is, working just like I had guessed months ago, is that agents are going to default to what they were used to which is the three and three. And it's going to take a while and it will vary in different parts of the country how quickly we really move to the system that the lawsuits were designed to bring into play, which is a seller will decide what commission is worth to the agent representing them and buyers will decide what the buyer's agent is worth. Um, what will happen in practice for a good while is agents are still going to try to, as part of the negotiation between buyer and seller, protect the buyer's agent in a commission paid by the seller. That is not the design of what's supposed to happen. And what will eventually emerge, and it will emerge, is there will be different business models that buyer's agents use and different business models that listing agents use, representing the seller. And the commissions will move around and the forms of payment will change in how this works. So right now, you, if you are going out looking for a place to buy, you will be asked to sign a buyer's agent agreement. And in that agreement, you will be agreeing up front on you will compensate that buyer's agent taking you around at whatever commission or fee you are willing to do. Now, when a deal is made with a seller, it may be part of the negotiation that the seller absorbs both sides of that commission that was pre-agreed to. But that will be up to negotiation. It is not an edict anymore and there's not price fixing anymore. And 
again, people are not used to this as consumers because we very rarely buy a house or sell a house, most of us. And so this is going to be uncharted territory. But all you agree to up front as a seller is whatever commission you're agreeing up front to pay that agent you're hiring. The change is you as a buyer are going to have to agree up front what compensation when that buyer's agent takes you to see a place, what you're going to pay them. And then that will ultimately come into the mix of the overall negotiations and whether that money comes out of the hide of the seller only or the buyer and the seller will be part of that negotiating process. All right. I hope that made some sense. Since the last two times I've talked about it, people were not happy in the industry how I explained it. We'll go to some questions here. This is from Sheila in Connecticut. We are residents of Connecticut and want to leave due to rising taxes. And our dollars were No, going- <laughs> no. Connecticut has high taxes. I never knew that. <laughs> uh, our dollars will go further in another state. We're looking to move to West Virginia for low costs and taxes and beautiful views. My question is, our house in Connecticut needs some updating, like bathrooms and a deck. Is it worth it to sell our house without updates as is and put that money toward a new home? Or do we do the updates and then sell? We are in a town that houses sell quickly and more than an asking price. So Sheila... Um, cosmetic improvements will help a lot in how fast the home sells and what price it sells. You start getting involved in doing a bathroom update, oh my goodness, the time you're going to lose and the expense, even a bathroom update, unless you're uh, someone who's capable of doing that work personally, you will not make back the cost of that redo. You may get the home sold quicker, and it will sell for more money with a brand new uh, primary bathroom or whatever. Um, you know, they always talk about kitchens and baths. Yep. I mean, people want updated kitchens and baths, and they'll pay you more for it. But if the house is one you're getting ready to sell, Sheila, and you then go through the months and hassle of updating that bathroom, you may then find you gave up all that time and you still didn't make back the cost of what it cost you to update that bathroom. If somebody, let's say a different situation, you've been living in a house and you hate the old bathroom and kitchen and you bring in the contractor, you update both. And you, you get to enjoy it for a number of years and then you go to sell the home. Yes, you're gonna get more money for the house and your house will likely sell quicker because nobody has to look at it with the eye of, oh, I got to do this and I got to do that. So, yeah. But in terms of doing it to get the house ready for sale, no. But when I talk about doing the cosmetics, if parts of the house need, uh, like if there's a gutter hanging that needs repairing or replacing, do it. If the landscaping looks really sad, fix it. If you need to paint places in your home, paint them. Do things that make the house happier from the curb and happier when somebody walks in the front door and get rid of clutter in the house, get rid of clutter in the closets. I was also going to say, I would talk to your real estate agent too, and they usually have people that could come in and um, stage your own furniture. Some people bring in outside furniture or tell you what to do, what to get rid of. Really honest. You know, they're going to be super honest with you, and that's important. And that could be very helpful because they're in the business and they know. Um, Meg in North Carolina says, due to life changes, divorce, I bought a new construction home and moved in in the first quarter of 2023. Clearly, my mortgage rate is high, right around 8%. Whoa. Thankfully, I can manage the current mortgage, but I would really like to refi to a lower rate and invest my mortgage savings into another savings or investment account with the actual returns or keep my mortgage payment. But I would really like to refi to a lower rate and invest my savings into another savings and investment account with actual returns. I miss the days of 2 to 3% rates. It sounds like the Fed is going to stair-step down the rates. How do I know when to refi? That is a great question, and the trend is clearly your friend now after it was your foe at the beginning of 23. 
and rates are headed down. And this is always the puzzle, is when is that moment that you go ahead and refi? And I will tell you what I've said in the past, when we've been in these cycles where rates turn lower and you just don't know when's bottom, when you're going to say, oh, I should have, would have done it then. And right now with 30 years, depending where you are in the country, around six and a half and 15 years now at 5.625, five and a half, depending on where you are in the country, if your credit standing is really good, if you are in a position to be able by dropping the rate from 8% to let's say 5.5% in a 15-year loan, if you can afford the payments on the 15-year loan, I say you go ahead and do it if you can get one in the mid-fives. Um, the savings and interest will be gigantic. And instead of you starting over with a new 30-year loan, you're now going to be in a 15-year uh, loan, shaving 13 years almost uh, say 13 yeah mm -hmm. 13 years almost um, yeah 13 years off your loan she's been in there too yeah yeah the savings are are fantastic um, if you were looking at going into a new 30 year loan you're talking about maybe the rates are down a point and a half if your credit score qualifies you you could instead look at a credit union that offers uh, lower no-cost refis and take the rate, let's say, from eight to seven as an example, and then there's no loss. If you've not paid significant closing costs, you go ahead and get the rate lower, and then if rates come down a fair amount more, then you lock in in a new loan. There are people who, when rates fell in the last cycle, refinanced repeatedly and lower no-cost refis one after another over time. Uh, but knowing the exact minute you're when, nobody has that perfect crystal ball. Uh, one thing, rates have fallen faster than economists predicted just of late. Okay, a couple of Costco questions for you, one of your favorite topics. Sean in Minnesota says, we live about 40 miles from the nearest Costco. We typically get to the metro area about one or maybe two times per month. What do you think about us getting a membership? We have a family of four. Also, if we do get a membership, which level do you think we should get? We don't do a whole lot of traveling. And then Greg in California said, I saw a blurb in one of your newsletters about Costco, my favorite store, raising membership prices, and it got me thinking. You have said many times that they mark up only 14 or 15 percent, and that represents break even for its operations. Then you further go on to say they make all their profit from membership dues. Based on what you said, dues are a pure profit income stream for them. So if they're raising membership, isn't that just a way to line their pockets more? They can't claim increased costs because that is wrapped into their markup. I'm sure there's a logical explanation, and I'm looking forward to hearing it. All right, so let's deal Explain with... Explain yourself, Costco. <laughs> like I have to defend them. <laughs> <laughs> so um, let me deal with the second question first, since that will be what's most fresh in people's minds. So you've got the cost of goods in the store, which are usually capped 14% for brand names. Uh, and 15% for Kirkland Signature. And then you have the membership fee that's where all the money is. So why would Costco raise the membership fee? Aren't they just lining their pockets? So they're suffering from inflation as well. So to have the equivalent level of profit for stockholders, inflation adjusted, every so often, usually every six or seven years, Costco bumps up the cost of membership fees. I mean, the membership fees in warehouse clubs, when warehouse clubs started, were, I think, about $15 a year uh, back when warehouse clubs started in, I think, the late 70s. Um, and so inflation is what has pushed those up over the years. And so the idea is to run the stores as as one Wall Street analyst derisively referred to as the world's largest co-op, that to run the stores at break-even, essentially, when you include the cost of the land and the utilities 
and the staff and the benefits of the staff and all that. And so the profit comes from membership fees and that's why the increase every so often to get that mix right between not having too many people say this isn't worth it at the same time have a return to the shareholders. That's the deal. Now, Sean, in joining Costco, 40 miles away, you don't say where you live in Minnesota how far you are from a Sam's Club. The merchandise mix in a Sam's versus a Costco is different. Um, but if you're buying, if you're a practical shopper and you're not into all the fun stuff that Costco tends to sell in addition to the practical items, and you have a Sam's closer to you, I would say join Sam's. On the other hand, if the treasure hunt experience at Costco, which is really fun, I mean, it's true. I shop at both. When I go into Sam's, I seem to automatically only buy necessities. When I go into Costco, I may buy necessities, but then I buy other stuff that is the fun stuff, the treasure hunt. So it's really what kind of shopper you are. The pricing of the everyday goods is so similar between Sam's and Costco that that would not be why to decide to join one versus the other. Let's say you don't have a Sam's anywhere closer to you than the Costco. Um, Costco, again, is more fun. And you will, because of that, spend more money inside than you would at a Sam's. Could you make the membership worth it? Either membership worth it for a family of four going once or twice a month? Absolutely. Uh, you should see what the people in Alaska do where they come into a Costco and they buy so much stuff you can't imagine because they may not go back to Costco from where they are in Alaska for another three months and they find it way worth it. So that is the report from <laughs> the man from Costco. Are we adding that to the man from Roth and the man from Credit Freeze? No, because I actually do love shopping at both Sam's and Costco. And before I get a Clark Stinks, why do I never talk about uh, BJ's Wholesale Club? Because they are a regional player that is along the eastern seaboard, along the Atlantic coast. I think of the I-95 corridor principally from, I guess, Maine to Florida. And it doesn't have enough applicability to people around the country. I want to thank you so much for joining us today. I hope that your Friday the 13th is absolutely great and that the weekend coming forward is a wonderful weekend. And know that all weekend long, we're here to serve you at Clark.com and ClarkDeals.com. When you're trying to figure out how to make a decision about something with your wallet, we're there for you. On that, I want to make one point. We are in, there are certain times that are inflection cycles for your wallet. I talked about one a few days ago, what's going on with major appliances, uh, electronics, with vehicles right now and how there's real opportunity for buyers. There's another as well. There is an all out price war going on in the cell phone industry, not for the phones themselves, but for the service. And if you have not reshopped your cell phone service in the last three months, you are missing an opportunity with the price wars going on to save an enormous amount on what it costs for you as an individual or what it costs for you as a collective of family and friends on a plan. And the individual plans for one person or two people are by far the cheapest they've ever been right now. And this is a special area of research that we do on Clark.com and take the time if you have time. Let's say you're watching football this weekend and you're watching college football, so you got to get through six minutes of commercials so off every so often. Use those six minutes to go look at our cell phone plan comparison guide where you put in 
what, how many lines there are, uh, who uses them, all that, and you'll see how much money you can save right now. It's a stunner. So have this wonderful weekend, but save yourself money while you're doing it. Because what we're about is you learning ways to save more, spend less, and avoid getting ripped off. And we'll see you Monday.